I'm a little. I'm here today with Mr. James, Mr. James, and Thomas. And Thomas. And today we're gonna to be discussing the sunk cost fallacy. I thought I wasn't gonna be back home for um, three weeks. We we're supposed to be in upstate oh, New York. I'll be on here. But it turns out I'm not. We're home already. I'll be on here. Yeah. Up back. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, that's Daddy's crotch. Uh, Don't uh, jump on uh, Daddy's crotch. Uh, uh. So we're going to have a discussion with Amy today, discussing the sunk cost fallacy, and Thomas is going to go take a nap. Okay, go take a nap, Thomas. Can you I say bye-bye? I'm going to keep being on the show. Bye-bye. I'm going to keep being on the show. You're going to keep being on the show for one second? Bye, Thomas. Okay. Oh, Thomas. Yeah. You can shut the door if you want, Amy. So, first things first. What is the sunk cost fallacy? Well... Fortunately, Wikipedia can help us with this. In economics, let's read right here. We're going to read Wikipedia. Hey, Amy, do you want to read Wikipedia? No. In economics and business decision-making, a sunk cost, known as a retrospective cost, is a cost that's already been incurred and cannot be recovered. That sounds a little bit like poker, right? When you're playing a hand, once you put that money in the pot, it cannot be recovered. You cannot take it back. So... Sunk costs are contrasted with prospective costs, which are future costs that can still be avoided by taking an action. This is very important. Some things you've already done, you've already paid for them. You already did that. But you can always pivot and change the future. Even though economists argue that sunk costs are no longer relevant for future dis rational decision-making in everyday life, people often take previous expenditures in situations such as repairing a house or car, to their future decisions regarding those things. Today Which basically Friday. means... Today is Friday. Today is Friday, that's right. A lot of people think that just because they have done something in the past that they must continue doing it to some extent because they are, well, pot committed. Let's read right here. The bygones principle, which basically means... You've already, you're, you can read Wikipedia if you'd like. Does not... Accord with real world behavior. Sunk That's costs do, in fact, influence. Some costs do, in fact, influence people's decisions. Yeah, you got your notes. You got your notes ready. What do you want to talk about today? Okay. I want to talk about you. See this one? I write this. You wrote that? Yeah, I'm writing this. Okay. I write this, guys. Okay. 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 And that's all I need. <laughs> and today, right. I, and today I'm going outside. That's right. You're going to go outside. I'm going at the park. You're going to go to the park today? Oh, but I'm going to tell you, don't want to waste my scent. I have a sentence today. Right. I need a sentence. A sentence? Yeah. Yeah, you're going to have a sentence today. Okay, can we proceed? Okay. An everyday example of this. A person may purchase a ticket to a baseball game and then find after several innings they are not enjoying the game. Okay? After several innings of going to a baseball game, you realize this is not fun because, you know, baseball is kind of boring. You sit there and they hit a ball around the stick. You decide, all right, this isn't for me. You thought you wanted to go, but now you don't love it anymore. So at this point, you realistically have two options. You can accept the waste of money on the ticket. And watch the remainder of the game. Yeah, stop, here's stop, your, James. Here's your ticket, Daddy. Here's your ticket, Mommy. Here's your ticket, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Here you go. Now you, now you can go on the tram. Thank you. Now I can go on the tram. Thank That's you. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I put it in your pocket so you, don't, pocket so you don't lose it. I won't lose it. All right. Thank you. You can accept that you've wasted the money and then watch the rest of the game being bored out of your mind without enjoying here's it. Here's your money. Thank so you. To go on the tram. Or you can accept. Put it in your pocket. Or you can accept. Huh? that you wasted the money on the ticket, and then leave and do something else. Thank you. Put it in your pocket. Those Thank are your you. options. Two, and, uh, yeah, that's your portion. Why are we still reading off of Wikipedia? Because I'm explaining what the sunk cost fallacy is. Right, People don't just, know what it is. We can just use our own example. This is a good, clear example. Okay, so is our situation. We're not there yet. Okay. Okay, <coughs> let me go here. So now, Cover your mouth, right? How do we cover our oh, mouth when we talk? You need to, you show, not, show them how you cover your mouth. You go. Yeah. Okay. 
Then now you know, okay, now here's your money. Thank you. Put it in your pocket. Thank you. Let me all know what you all prefer here. Do you want to hear James continue talking, or do you want and me to get to money. my spiel? Here's Thank your you. money, Daddy. Thank you. Put it in your pocket. Thank you. Because I have a whole spiel lined up, and I'm going to forget it, I'm sure. So. Oh, watch out. You ready to go to Delma? Oh. Ready to go play? No, I want to go, I'm going to play. Be on the show. You are on the show. Look, everyone can see you. Can you no. say hello? No, I will Look up at that camera and say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. You see the blue light? That's where the people are. Hmm, confusing. See, look, somebody wrote, we love Mr. James. Look, we love Mr. James. They love you. See, look, what's that name over there? Jay. James, right? All right, well, apparently you all like Mr. James. If you're listening <laughs> to this on the audio format, sorry, it's been a mess so far. We're only eight minutes in, and we have not gotten much out of our mouth so far. Besides Mr. James. James, we recently came back from a trip. Did you like the trip we you went on? To, you need to set your test. You need to what? Set your test. Set the test? Yeah. Yeah, you know you got pen on your face. Oh, speaking of a test, I actually have a, ta a test for all of you. Go to pokercoaching.com slash free cash. We're giving away a total of $2,500 in cash this month. And if you answer a poker question right there, you will be very live to win your share of this week's prize. So check that out at pokercoaching.com slash free cash. I already set that test. Go take it. Okay. James, where did we just go? I don't know. Where, where did we come back from? Where was our trip? Roosevelt Island. <laughs> Roosevelt Island? Yeah. Well, you guys go on Roosevelt Island. We just came back from upstate New York. We went on a trip. We expected to go for three weeks. But what happened, Amy? We made it three days. Mmm. And we had already prepaid for the place. It was not It was not cheap. Here's, here's your money. Thank you. Put yeah, it in here, your pocket. Here's your money. Put it in your Put, pocket, guy. Put it in your pocket. So, Amy, why in the world would we come home after three days into a three-week trip? Pocket. Um, because okay, she did. The, while the house was pretty unique and special, um, it was from the 1800s, had all this original detail in it. It was just really cool. And it was in a really pretty part of the woods yeah. by a river. Hey, mommy, I sound like the Pope. Mommy's yeah. talking. Um, it was like really, 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 really hot where the bedrooms were. Imagine so, like an attic in the summer, but humid. It was hot. Hot. It was over 90 degrees at night, um, and we know that because we had the kids' monitor in the room, and the monitor gauges temperature. So, um, so nobody could sleep um, upstairs where all the bedrooms were. Slow down, so. slow down, slow down. Also, it's worth mentioning we asked ahead of time if it would be hot in the place. Yeah, because... I was, I was going to get there. Okay, sorry. Short. No, it's okay. Um, so, so that was frustrating, and we knew going into it that the house did not have air conditioning. But we had asked in advance how hot it got because it didn't have air conditioning, and the owner had said because it's a stone, a stone cottage, it actually stays very cool and regulates weather very well. Um, and it just—I don't know if we just happened to come during a particularly hot time, but nothing we did was helping the temperature. We closed all the shades. We opened windows when it was cool to let breeze in. We closed them when it was hot. We. Bought box fans, and um, so what ended up happening is um, there was a bedroom on the bottom level, which was the coolest level. So John and I and the two kids slept in that room. So the four of us in one room, and it was a big room. It wasn't like we were scrunched in, but we were in one room. And the upstairs stop, stop bedrooms were that. left empty, yeah, except for sleep, our nanny sleep. and her daughter, who had come with us, needed to sleep somewhere. So they took one of those bedrooms, and we tried our best to make it cooler for them, but they just, they weren't sleeping. They weren't getting any sleep at night. Nothing we were doing was helping. To be fair, the owner was as helpful as he could be. I mean, he didn't seem to kind of believe how hot it was, but... Um, he eventually said he would, well, we asked actually about getting like a floor or portable AC unit so that we could plug it in upstairs. And he, have, he did say that he would um, order one and it would come later that week. But it was just four or five days later. The heat issue was, was really issue. However, we were willing to work on the heat issue and wait for the air conditioner to come. But then, I mean, the timing of this couldn't have been crazier. John and I... After out on our third night, we had put the kids down to bed. We were sitting down to watch a TV show together, and we said, "Do we think we're going to stay for the rest of our time here?" And John said, "Yeah, I think we're going to stay. I think he'll work with us to fix the heat issue. We can, you know, we'll make, we'll stay." 
At that moment, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something scurry across the floor. And I said to John, I said, I think I just saw a mouse. And it turns out the house ended up having something. We don't know if it was a mouse. Oh my gosh. We don't know if it was a mouse. Nope. You can't but then the next anymore. day we saw some of our food in the kitchen had been eaten. Can you see this? Um, so there was some critter in the house. Um, and when we emailed the owner about that issue, he really he really didn't believe he didn't believe us. And then um, when we told him when we showed him the picture of the eaten food, he told us that maybe we brought the mouse from Manhattan. Um, because you know, why wouldn't we? <laughs> so that we brought it in our suitcases. Um, and he said he would call an exterminator. Stop. You um, say with me. But the problem was is even if an exterminator came that day, it's not like it gets rid of the mice that day. The exterminator has to find the mice, has to take care of the mice, then the mice have to go, run away or die. And, you know, so we'd be living in a house with mice. He has to go. He does have to go. Yeah, it's time on. to go. Come on, James. All right, that was fun. Tell everybody bye bye. No, I need to bring my present. You want a present? What kind no, of present? I want my present. Your... Stop, I need that. Those are my notes. I want my notes. Okay, go show Delma no, the what? drawing you made on your no, leg. Okay, go show her the drawing on your leg. Can you wave and say bye bye, everyone? Good no. luck in your games? No, can you, no, no. Can you watch them, Mama? No, 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 James. Watch We're going to go. Say, tell her, oh, they say bye bye, James. <gasps> say oh, bye bye. What's everyone saying? Do you say bye bye? Everyone's saying bye bye. Can you blow a kiss? Go kiss. Aw, they love You're you. You're a sweet boy. All right, I'll see you for the next show tomorrow. Go get them, okay? There you go. Show them the nice drawing you made on your leg. There you go. Bye. Love you. James. Hey, James. Thank you. James, please. James, please. Um, anyway. So at that point we realized we had to leave because even if the AC, even if the guy got us an AC and that the heat issue got fixed, the mice issue wouldn't get fixed. And part of the issue was our kids were sleeping on the floor because of the heat problem. So we had, you know, brought a mattress downstairs from upstairs and put it on the floor for James. So we were freaking out that like mice would be scurrying around the floor where he was. And Thomas was in a travel crib where the mattress lays on the floor. So I think at that point we just said, I think we need to, you know. Time to muck. Cut our losses and head home. And I was pretty devastated. I had actually two really, really, really good cries. Um, Why were you devastated? Oh, um... You know, we never do anything like this. I don't know what people's vision or view of John is, but it's not like we're like, um, it's not like we throw a lot of money around. We don't go on extravagant, you know, adventures all the time. Um, we're not, you know, it's just, we're, we tend to be homebodies and we tend to be really nitty when it comes to like taking trips or doing anything too adventurous with the kids because we want to be mindful of their schedule. We want to be mindful of, you know how hard it's going to be to get somewhere we just so we decided to do this thing where I wanted I had spent my summers growing up upstate um, and you know running around in the woods and playing I wanted to give something like that to my kids we had a hard time finding a house we finally found a house for, ha for three weeks it's hard three, to find it three weeks yeah, long for three so. weeks um, everything was really expensive. We were shocked how expensive things were, but we finally found something. We showed up, we immediately went to the store, bought $500 worth of groceries to but be also, fully stocked because it's kind of secluded. But also, we know? showed up at the house and fell in love with the house. We yeah. were just so excited. I mean, the yard was perfect for the kids. We ended up finding some broken glass in the yard later, but whatever. You know, we the yard was so nice and it had deer that would walk through it. It was by a river. James was seeing fish. The house was just, I mean, the historical detail in it was just so cool. Like, you really felt like you were stepping away from it all. We really wanted to be happy there. Um, shall, shall I find it on the internet? No. No? No. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We talked about this. Um, <laughs> I was going to show this. It was pretty. It was Please a pretty don't. place. We really wanted to be happy there, and I think we had so many expectations of enjoying our trip and doing this thing with our kids, so... It was pretty upset when it didn't work out. And then once we came home and like we finally got the kids down and unpacked a little bit and I sat on the couch and everything was over, I think I just had like a second cry where I just burst into burst into tears. It was just very frustrating. And I think on top of it, the other thing that was frustrating is that the owner didn't believe us. 
So after we emailed him to tell him we were leaving, um, he basically said that he was shocked and that he's he's convinced that something else must be going on to prompt us to leave the house because he was doing everything right and um, he doesn't understand why we would leave. And I think, you know, I tend to take things personally um, and I know that John and I are good people and we're honest people and we try to do the right thing and be kind to each other and to others and the fact that the guy couldn't see that our three-week trip had been kind of ruined um, and through no fault of the owner, you know, I mean, he was trying, but, you know, that we were trying to do special for our kids and he thought we were trying to pull one over on him, um, really bummed me out. So. Pause. I believe we just got raided and Daniel Moore, Poker Brawl, some people here. We're going to get to poker in just a second. We're discussing the sunk cost fallacy, which we're going to show you're not actually pot committed in just a second. Be patient. We're getting there. Yeah, I'm going to stop talking soon. So you'll have John for the rest <laughs> of the hour. Um, I actually think that's about all I have. So. Um, well, so what did we do? Instead of staying there with mice, with our left. kids on the floor, in the heat, after spending a bunch of money to rent the place, because at Airbnb, you rent the place up front, and then like you don't get a refund if you, if you leave, typically, uh, we decided to leave. And the reason is because we really had two options. We could either come home, which we know is fine, and muck on the vacation, or we could stay at a place where we were definitively unhappy for the most part. Yeah. Some things were great. We got some great pictures of the kids in the backyard, but it was really, it was, it was unlivable for us. So we packed up and left. We came home, um, filed a complaint with Airbnb. I was on the phone for forever. I sent them emails that didn't reply, but I did message them on Twitter. Airbnb helped. They got right back to me and, um, they resolved the issue. We got a full, well, we got a refund for all of the unused days, which was the majority of them. And then they gave me basically 50% off the days that we stayed there, which I think is perfectly fine. I thought it was like 50, 50, if we'd get anything back. So to get, um, I don't know what would be 90, 95% of the money back. We were very, very happy like that. Yeah. I was, that. I was shocked. I was shocked because then at, at least at that point, it just feels like, okay, we had a three day trip, right? We paid for our time and came home as opposed to like, we're out, you know, a lot more money um, for something we didn't get to take advantage of. If you um, just got here, what was wrong with the place? The place was incredibly hot, like 95 degrees when we was told we were told it would be cool because it was a stone cottage and it had um, some type of rodent. It had some type of rodent running around eating our food on multiple levels. So there you go. Yeah, um, so that's what was wrong. So we packed it up and we left, came home, fought hard, fought, fought a little bit with Airbnb, got the refund. The owner did not want to give us a refund, but um, Airbnb thought we were justified in getting a refund. So how does this apply to poker? Or do you want to say one more thing? Fine. I, what I thought was actually kind of interesting about the whole thing is that John and my's rea my reactions to the situation changed every day. Um, so at first John was very calm about it as you know that's what John is like <laughs> and I was very worried about it so the first night we put the kids so I didn't even mention that we actually did try to put the kids upstairs in the heat we thought maybe it would cool off overnight you know because upstate in the woods things get actually chilly you know at night you even want to put layers on um, but within like five minutes of the kids being in the room, they were drenched in sweat. They weren't even able to fall asleep and they were cranky and upset. So we had to take them out and I was panicking from the first night. I was like, this, this is unlivable. How can we do this with the kids and with our, you know, with our nanny and her daughter up here too. And John was calm. He was just like, we're going to figure this out. Then on the second day, I think <laughs> I started to calm down a little bit and he started to get frustrated about the heat because he realized in order to, because the layout of the house was a little funky for what we needed because John and I still needed a place to work. We weren't on, we hadn't, we weren't on vacation, we were working. Um, and the only place for him to work was in one of the hot bedrooms. So he spent an entire day working out of the hot bedroom and he ended up pretty upset the second day. <laughs> it's worth mentioning, I decided to get off coffee for this whole three week period, so I was, I'm not know, in my right mind I don't anyway. know that that's really had anything to do with it. Maybe it didn't. And then by the third day, I think both of us had semi-calmed down together because we had gotten the box fans. We thought it was going to get better. And then the mice showed up 
And then he lost his mind. And then he got really upset. He's like, that's it. I'm furious. This is horrible. Like, we, we've got to... We're out of here. See ya. Yeah. And so, um, anyway, so we both kind of went back and forth on what to do every time. So... Okay. Now we're both calm. Now we're both calm. <laughs> Happy as can be at home. We've already booked us another two-week trip at a different place. It seems to not have mice as far as we can tell. And uh, we're excited about that. That'll be later in, in a few months. So anyway, <laughs> let's take a look at a poker hand. This is something a lot of people screw up. And we're going to test Amy on this because Amy has won a charity poker tournament. So if she doesn't get this right, do I disown her? Mm -hmm. No, I do not. Okay, here we have a hand. We have seven six of clubs. They fold to us. We're going to play our seven six of clubs. We raise... Big blind calls, okay? Flop comes. Queen, eight, five, two clubs. So we have a straight flush draw. Pretty good hand, right? Mm-hmm. Opponent checks. We should probably bet, right? Yeah. You Well, you don't, it's not called raising, right? You bet. Correct. We're not okay. betting. A raise is when someone bets in front of you. Right. So the so first I'm action is a bet, and then you would raise them if that So I'm going to bet. So we're going to bet. We do bet. Opponent calls. Calls. Turn is an ace of spades. Opponent checks again. Well, we have the seven high. This ace has to look kind of scary to the opponent, right? Mm -hmm. So, should we continue? To the opponent or to me? To the opponent, because the opponent may not... Like, I could easily be betting the flop with ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, ace-ten, right? Mm -hmm. So the ace hits my range very well. So, we should probably keep betting. Okay. Whenever you have no I showdown... I thought you were going to ask me. I'm going to ask you the hard question. Oh, because I was going to say bet. Good. We should bet here. Because this is... I think you taught me that when you're the, when you're the like aggressor, and you don't, you know, that you have to keep. Continue bet. You have to continue bet. And also, continue, you just have to keep bet. I don't know any of the phrases, by the way. I just know what the action is. <laughs> I know what the. So first things first. In general, when you have a draw that cannot win at the showdown, when it goes check, 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 check. You usually want to be betting that. And seven high, if we miss, does not win, right? At the, at the river. Right. So we want to bet this to try to get our opponent to fold. Also, the ace is great for, for my range because I would bet everything on this flop, right? You know, we continuation bet the flop every time. Um, so this ace is great for me and not so great for my opponent because if he had like ace two, ace three, ace eight, or I'm sorry, ace seven, he would just check fold the flop. So we have a lot more aces than our opponent. So this is a very, I wasn't, very... Yeah, you talked too fast for me. Okay, fine. This is a very easy turn bet. Okay. We bet. Opponent raises. First things first, for everyone who's wondering, I was going to go all in on any river card. Even a queen, I don't care. Okay. We bet 700, and now the opponent raises. Oh my gosh. And is it a big raise? What is it? We bet 700, the opponent makes it 2,000. Okay, first things first, let's get out the calculator to see how often... We need to win to justify calling. How often do we need to improve? What you do here is you take the amount we have to call, which is 1300, right? Because we already have seven in, divided by the total pot that will be in there. So it's uh, 36 plus 13, which is um, what? Five, five, uh, 4900, right? 4930. 4930 equals so we need to win 26 ish percent of the time okay mm -hmm. so how often will our flush draw or straight come in well there's nine flush cards plus an additional six cards that give us the straight so there's 15 cards that can come out of roughly 45 so 15 and 45 remaining cards 15 divided by 45 is roughly 33 percent so we need to win 26 percent of the time but we know we're going to get there 33 percent of the time so we have to continue. We cannot fold here. Mm -hmm. We are not folding. So the question is, notice if I call for 1,300, I'm only going to have 600 chips left, which is like nothing, right? Mm -hmm. so what, are the, what are the blinds? The blinds are 50, 100. We'll have six big blinds left. Oh. Not a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So the question is, should we go all in or should we call? This is the difficult question that a lot of people screw up. And if you get it right, I will, I will keep you. If you get it wrong, I will keep you too. Should we go all in or should we call? How long do I have to decide? You have 10 seconds. Is there an easy everyone, way? Everyone, yeah. everyone in the chat box, type what you think we should do here. The, uh, I'm not even going to give you any, I'm not even going to give you any, any, uh, any hats. 
I guess I'm gonna call. Why? Because, <laughs> it gets more difficult. I because um, I don't want him to call my all in. I think he's always gonna call if you go all in, right? Yeah. And we're only gonna win thirty three percent of the right. time. Right. It's very close to the twenty six. So I I'm not too crazy about that margin. So I I think I would just call. Right. The only is reason is that the right answer. That is the right answer. Oh, he's gonna keep me. I've asked Amy about ten poker questions on a little coffee, and she has gotten every single one right. You using guys. Good logic. You guys, I got it right. Rad Dad Poker here nails it. There's no fold equity with a shove. So if we go all in, the opponent's going to call us literally every time. So, do you want to put your last 600 chips in, knowing you're going to win about 33% of the time? You'd rather just keep them and get it in where you're going to win 40 or 50 or 60% of the time later, on a, on a future hand. And if we call and get there, we're still going to get that other 600 chips in the pot. Right? I mean, it's not, not going to be a problem, because whatever the opponent has, has they have something. So... You basically want to ask yourself, do I want to invest the last bit of my money with no fold equity, meaning my opponent's never going to fold, knowing that I'm at a big disadvantage? And the answer is no. You don't want to put the rest of your money in at a big disadvantage. You would rather put your money in better. You're going to be able to get your money in better than 33% in the future. So the play here is to call and then play very straightforwardly on the river. A lot of people here, though, they go all in. They have the sunk cost fallacy. They think they're pot committed. They think, I have almost all my money in, so I might as well put the rest in. Or, or well, I, or that, you know, you know, or they think that maybe there's still a chance I can scare him off. That, you know, which, which the problem, but then the problem is, is, I think you taught me early on, don't, don't do anything crazy if you don't want them to call. <laughs> don't do anything crazy if I don't want them to call? Yeah, because he's going to call. Do something and crazy I, if I want them to fold? You said you play most aggressively with your best hands and your worst hands. And this is Typically, either a best hand or a worst hand. Well, no, this is a worst hand. This is a 7 eye right now. So this is a bad hand. Oh, okay. But, well, but okay. listen, the opponent has to put in 600 more to call into a pot that will be 5,200 total. Right, that would be easy for him. He's not folding. Yeah. Anthony says, what if he has a king 10? Would he fold if he had king 10? He shouldn't have king 10. Then he, should, <laughs> he wouldn't have raised two... Why? Why? Whoever is raising with 2K with King 10 is going to call is going to call an additional 600. Yeah, and to be fair, he actually should because he beats all the random draws. So we have literally no fold equity. You think we may have some fold equity, says Anthony. I completely, completely doubt that. 600 into 5200 would be insane for the opponent to fold anything. Oh, GS yeah, says, I'm sorry. GS I didn't says, sleep last night, sorry. GS says we should fold to the turn raise. We should not fold to the turn raise. So do we get to see what happens next? <sighs> well, we already know what's going to happen. On any card where I make a flush or a straight, I'm going to call. What if I make a pair of sevens or sixes? Do I call it off? Yuck, I think I probably am supposed to. Let's think about this. Say I do make a pair of sevens or sixes. At that point, I need to put in 600 to win 5,200. So I need to win 12% of the time to profit. The tough part about that is that I actually do beat some draws the opponent could perhaps have. The opponent may randomly have king-10 of clubs or something like that. If he has king-10 of clubs and I get that 7 on the river, I, I win. So I think I actually am supposed to call it off on the river, but it's definitely close. It's definitely close, okay? And if I miss on the river, I fold when the guy bets. Yeah. What if he checks the river? Do I bluff for 600 if I miss? <laughs> That's a fun one, right? Yeah. I would not, exactly. So notice here, when we call this check raise on the turn, we are no profiting a lot. You're already, you, if you checked, well, then you're either going to win or lose that hand, and so you should only be putting in the additional money if you know you've won, and you don't know you've won. If we think he's never going to fold. I think for that for that additional amount, he's probably not. If he was going to do it for the 600 before, he'll do it for the 600 later. There's no difference to him. Not, not if he has, imagine he actually had, say he had four three of clubs. Let's just pretend he randomly had that one hand yeah. that we that we beat, right? If he had the four or three of clubs, he will fold it on the river when he misses, right? Because he has the not low. Right? What do you mean he has three, four, five, six, seven? No, no, no. I'm, let's, let's he just already say, has slow it. Slow down. No, no. Say he has four three. He has four three in his hand. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Say he has four three. It, okay. Presume he has four three. Sorry, yeah. And he checks this river. If I bet, he's going to fold. Neat thing about this, though, is that... In this scenario, we beat 4-3. What if he has, um, I don't know, king, king seven, or king, king three of clubs, let's say. 
Will the opponent fold king three on the river if they check? I wasn't listening. <laughs> Amy gets distracted by the chat. I do. <laughs> um, she can't read and think about poker at the same time. It turns out it's difficult to think about poker if you don't study poker all day every day. What this amounts to is I'm just done with this hand. And let me explain why. When we call this turn check raise, we are making money. We need to win 26% of the time, and we're going to win about 30 to 33% of the time, okay? So we profited there. We're going to get back 33, and we put in 25. Think of the value, right? I mean, that's just printing money. So this call here is definitively profitable. I don't think shoving for 600 more is profitable. I think we're putting the other rest of our money in for 33%, and we don't have to put the rest of our money in for th with 33%. Anyway, river comes. It's a six. I'm sorry. It's a... It's a jack. Opponent goes all in for 600. Do we call or do we fold? We can't beat anything besides like a few sporadic insane bluffs. And um, get out of there! Yeah. Save yourself! And we fold. And this is a spot a lot of people cannot comprehend. We put in 2,400 chips out of our 3,000, and now we're folding. But aren't we pot committed? No, because we win literally 0% of the time. Maybe like 2% of the time or 3% of the time. Almost none, okay? So a lot of people make the big error putting in the rest of the money on the turn, thinking, well, it's almost all in anyway, so I might as well put in the rest, and that's just not true. You didn't know I had a daughter. This is my wife, and she's older than I am. <laughs> Someone made an interesting point that you should really mix up the pronouns you use. You, yeah. You always refer to male players. Well, that's because I presume the opponent is really, really bad with his <laughs> so play. He must be a guy. <laughs> no female would play like this opponent just did. Nice save, nice think save. Think about how poor this opponent's strategy is. <laughs> it would be really sexist for me to call this a she, by the way, because <laughs> women are not that dumb. They're just not that dumb. I have more respect for women than that. Maybe you don't, but I do. <laughs> the opponent should always go all in on the spot. Because notice right here, they gave me good odds to call. And they don't want me to call if I have a draw, right? Yeah. If they instead went all in, I would still have to call, but I would have had to put all my money in bad instead of almost all of it. So the opponent, it's a, it's a guy, okay? It's, it's an idiot guy. The idiot guy allowed me to save this remaining 600 chips when he should not have. Does that make sense? So does that make you a she since you're playing it so great? Yeah. <laughs> I think men can play great as well, but women play well for the most part. Most men do not. Okay. Dang, these spots get you. This is very insightful. Well, good. I'm glad, I'm glad, to, glad to hear it. This is why I wanted to talk about this today. And this concept occurs in many, many things in life, right? Like, for example, the trick we were just on, right? Yeah. We had a choice. We could either put in the rest of the last 600 bad and stay for three weeks in a hot place with mice and after the exterminator comes, they're going to be dead mice. Do we want the dead mice on the floor with our children? Probably not, right? So would I be willing to muck the entire amount that we paid in exchange for not having that experience? And the answer is yes. And that was an easy one. But, I mean, this kind of thing comes up all the time in life, in business, in relationships. I mean, you want to talk about relationships? People get divorced, right? We're not getting a divorce. We're not announcing that today. Um, <laughs> not yet. Be patient, everyone. <laughs> um, but think about it, right? So let's let's talk about jobs and careers, right? Let's say you go to school, you get a good degree. Let's say you're going to be a lawyer, right? You go and you get a law degree, and you decide after a year working at a law firm, wow, I hate this. I hate this job immensely. I come home crying every day. I do not like it. Do you stick with it? And that's a tough question because. In this scenario, you'll probably make less money doing whatever else you're going to go do, right? Because being a lawyer pays good money. But you're really unhappy. So what's happiness worth? Is it worth more than money? And the question becomes, like, what's the difference in job you could get? Also, are there any other outside um, pressures on you? Like, maybe you just feel like, I always wanted to be a lawyer, so I have to be a lawyer, even if I hate it. I need to force myself to, to make it work. Or maybe your parents give you a problem. Maybe you have to provide for your family, right? There's many outside influences. So the question is, you have to figure out when you actually are pot committed and when you're not. Because in that poker hand, if that opponent went all in on the turn, we were pot committed there. We would have called off for all of our money. The math works out. We would have needed to win 30. We're going to win 33, right? So I don't know. Do you have any insights on this? Any thoughts on this? 
No? When, so you've changed jobs a time or two. Yes. Did, yes. Did you feel pot committed when you went from changing jobs? Because Amy worked at a... You know I did. Very prestigious <laughs> law firm. But it was hard. They were working all day every day, right? You didn't really love it. You know, I think I struggled for a really long time. I had always wanted to be a lawyer. I was doing exactly what I had always wanted to be doing. Um, but I was frustrated. Um, you know, you're just, you're, I, it's not even like my hours were that crazy. Um, but just, I, I just felt like I was meant to be somewhere else or doing, doing something else or maybe just in a different environment. You know, it was, um, you know, a really great firm. I find memories of it. I think it's, you know, a great place to start a career. Um, I'd consider circling back and going there again one day if it ever, like, had to, you know, camp. Like, I would never say, I would never, I, I wouldn't say that I'd never go back, but it just wasn't right for me at the time. I think the biggest thing I struggled with that was that my time away from the office was never actually away from the office. I was constantly on, everything was on high alert, always on call. Um, was, you know, kind of talked down to when I would try to take a vacation, even if I made myself available on the trip. So, you know, it was, it was just, you know, so I felt, we felt like we couldn't even take trips together that we wanted to do because I would just be anxious the whole time. It was just not great. But, you know, you, you put in a lot, or my parents put in a lot of money to help me get through college and get through law school. And I felt like I owed it to myself um, to keep doing it, and I owed it to my parents to keep doing it, and there was a lot of guilt involved. So, but eventually you realize you're not happy, and I found another law firm to try at, and I was there for a really long time, and kind of started to have some of those same feelings again several years in. I lasted longer at the next law firm, but, um, you know, ended up having some of those feelings come back. Um, and so I left practicing altogether and went to a tech startup, um, and I loved it. I mean, I, I don't know if I loved it because I loved the job itself or I just loved it because I finally had a break from practicing and maybe that's what I really needed all along was just like a real break. Um, but I loved it. I loved the work I was doing. I loved the team I was on. It was like a very um, uh, social job where I was constantly doing meetings and engaging with clients and uh, brainstorming on technology. It was just a really fun job. Um, and then just out of the blue, I got, um, reached, you know, so a recruiter reached out to me to go back and practice in-house. So I'm no longer at a law firm, but I'm now in-house and I love it. And so maybe what it really was is that I didn't feel, I shouldn't be leaving law. I just needed to find the right job in law. Um, and maybe it means being in-house is a better fit for me than practicing at a law firm and everything entails with being at a law firm. Um, but it's kind of funny, you know, I realized very early on, actually, when I was a very junior associate that I never really wanted to make partner, um, which is a weird feeling to have. What because, does make partner mean? Yeah, because uh, all any lawyer wants <laughs> whenever they start working at a law firm is to make partner. And it basically means law firms have um, a very simple um, promotion structure. You start off as an associate. And um, you can sometimes get promoted to a position called counsel, which is basically like a very senior attorney at the firm. Or you can get promoted to partner, which is effectively like an owner of the firm, along with all the other partners in the firm. Um, and it really is something that once you achieve it, you know, no one can really take it away from you. If you ever left to go somewhere else, you probably always have to lateral across as a partner. Um, and it's where a lot of the upside financially can come in. Um, so, you know, but, but whenever I looked at the partners I worked with, I didn't want to be any of them. They just, they always seem to be running from meeting to meeting, stressed, you know, cursing under their breath. Um, and I asked a few of them over the years, you know, why do you do what you do? And they say, actually, the one response that really sums it up I think he said, frankly, you just get used to the hours and you get used to the money. Um, and that was his answer. So it's not even that he particularly liked what he was doing anymore, but you just, you just get used to it. And I just never, I don't know, it just didn't seem like me. Um, and I remember telling a girlfriend of mine who was a lawyer um, that I, you know, she asked me, what are your plans to get promoted? And I was like, you know, I don't know that I really want to make 
partner. I, I'd be happy. I'd be happy being counsel or some other position that's still at the firm, but not at that partner level where there's also a lot of pressure to drum up business and you know increase. Yeah, you know, and she just was. I just remember she was shocked. She just, um, and I think she didn't respect my answer. Um, but anyway. Anyway, so that's why I think being in-house is just a better place for me. So, But yeah, when you're in a situation, sometimes it can be hard to figure out why you're not happy with the situation. So that makes it very hard to figure out what the answer to the situation is. Because if you can't pinpoint the problem, then you can't figure out the right solution. Scott says, uh, law firm partnership is like winning a pie-eating contest and the prize is more, more pie. pie. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> that's fun. So um, essentially, so... When you went to the tech startup, you were still using some things related to law, but not really, right? It was a law-based tech startup. Yeah, yeah. It but, was a legal, legal, tech, legal tech company. Well, I don't know where I'm going with that. So what I'm trying to say here the is point, that... I think the point you were probably going to make is that even if you change directions and you leave a situation and you, you know, avoid this some cost fallacy, it doesn't mean you leave everything behind. You can still leverage what you have in a different way. Right, and like in our poker hand example, we have our whopping 600 chips left. Let's leverage it to the best of our ability instead of just putting it in bad. And in the case of being a lawyer, you know, being in, in perhaps your case, just being unhappy for your whole career. And in our in our vacation situation, we came home, but like we had actually a couple days blocked out with nothing to do because we were we thought we'd be upstate. We're going to use those days now to take care of errands that have been waiting forever to just do something fun with the kids around here, you know, and so we just, you take, you take advantage and use what you have and you reallocate your resources accordingly. Okay. So we had a few questions about this poker hand. If the river is a seven or six, do we call if the opponent goes all in? I already said, I think the answer is a reluctant yes. Actually on something like a king, a jack or a 10, the answer may still be no. I'm sorry. What am I saying? Obviously, there was a seven or six. If there was a seven or six, yes, I call because we do beat a few sporadic bluffs. If we had more chips, would I still call on the turn? Yeah. If I had um a thou if I had sixteen hundred behind, that was the first question. I would still just call because I don't think we have any fold equity for sixteen hundred more. Right? The opponent's not going to put in this much and then fold. Um, if we had three thousand, three thousand six hundred, I think I still call because this is not a spot where I expect to get check raised on the turn very often because this ace is really good for me. When the turn is really good for your range and your opponent is now raising you, that implies they have a really strong range, right? Because why are they check raising into a strong range, a range that should be strong? So this is a spot where I'm not jamming anything actually. I'm, I'm just, well, I'm not jamming this low type draw hand because I really don't expect to have much fold equity at all. The nice thing about this is Whenever we do just call, we can expect to get the rest of the money, and even if we have like another three thousand behind on most rivers, because the opponent probably is just sitting here with a set or two pair or something, and they're not going to fold. All right. Um, okay, so let's get back to being pot committed slash sunk cost fallacy. Something else, friendships slash relationships, but friendships are some that we have, at least I have some experiences with. Maybe you do too, where. A lot of people hold on to friends from some point of their life that are not really beneficial for them at any point in time going forward. I know this sounds bad. I'm not saying people are disposable or anything like this. But like my friends from high school, a lot of them are still, they're, they're not doing anything overly productive with their life, okay? And to be fair, we were never great friends to begin with. But some of them want to perhaps catch up. Some of them want to stay in touch a little bit. This is long from a long time ago. And I never really had a desire to do that. Why? Because they were not going to be, I guess the answer is pr productive slash beneficial to my life and what I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, back when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. And you don't mean that in like a nasty way. I don't. You just mean they didn't make you happy either. Because even if they right. just made you happy to hang out with, that would have been enough. It's not like you were trying to get something from them. No, okay. that's correct. The, the way you were saying it was weird. I'm bad at saying things nicely. <laughs> he is he is bad at saying things nicely. Um, like, for example, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, all I really cared about was getting good at poker and spending a lot of time getting good at poker. And a lot of these people had no desire to do anything pertaining to poker, and that just did not fit with my current life and what I was trying to accomplish. Also, I was going to go, I had an idea, I had a concept. I lost it. This is what happens when I don't write down all my notes. All right, I'll talk instead. Two things. One, um... 
or actually one of them I'm going to disregard. Ah, you lost one too. No, I didn't lose it. I just decided I don't want to say it. It's funny that you mentioned like relationships because when we were at the house and we were packing up to leave, I, there was a moment at which I remember exactly where I was standing. I was standing on the patio, like walking into the screen door, like walking towards the screen door to go in. And I thought to myself, like, ugh, do we still try to make it work, even with these mice? I mean, how quickly do we think an exterminator can get rid of them? Do we just stay? We really wanted to. Anyway, and whenever I'm in a situation that I'm, I'm struggling, like, do I stay? Do I go? I always remember this guy when I was in like junior high I had a crush on this guy and he liked he at the time he liked me um you know so we had a crush on each other it was very innocent you know we like hugged once and it was you know that was glorious um and then we met again in college and we tried to date and it turned out he actually grew into a bit of a jerk um you know, it was like, it was actually very frustrating. But I think I had always had this romanticized re- memory of him from when I was younger, and I really still liked him and wanted to make it work. And he continued to treat me pretty badly and was just rude and um, disrespectful and just not nice and not caring and kind at all. Um, but it was one of those things where I kept trying to make it work because I just felt like if I could solve x issue if i could solve y issue this would be the perfect relationship right and then at some point you just realize like why am i fighting so hard to fix something that really you shouldn't have to fight so hard to fix and you know and then we lost touch and i try to avoid him for the rest of my life and i just Anyway, I just remember thinking, like, when we were at the house, like, it was, like, that same situation. I was like, if we can fix the heat, if we can fix the mice, if we can, <laughs> you know, If we can pick up the glass out of the yard. If we can just clean up the yard a little bit. If we can keep the kids away from the rickety stairs, you know, like, th- this place would be perfect. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, Amy, you're doing it again. So it's, it's, I mean, the analogy to relationships is really one that hits home for me, um, especially because I just I always go back to that to that um, to that relationship and how how silly I was, but it will always be one of I think my best lessons in how I want to be treated and how I want things to pan out and realizing if something's not right, you just have to leave and move on. Yep. I think you remembered what I you did. I wrote, down, so you I wrote it down. You wrote it down. So I was going to say that a lot of Imagine you put yourself in a room with 100 people like you are at school, right? You go to school, you're going to be around a bunch of people. Inevitably, you're going to like some of those people more than you like other, some of those other people, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you have any desire to be great lifelong friends with these people, especially if they change, if you have different interests, etc. But I guess that's really what it amounts to is I never really had any really great friends, I guess, in school. Maybe that's what it amounts to. I had friends in the band. I had friends who played Magic the Gathering. And, you know, you stop playing Magic MTG Gathering. MTG for life. Yeah, you stop playing MTG <laughs> for life. And because you're playing poker all the time and you kind of fall out of touch with those people. You stop going to band because you graduate school and you stop hanging out with those people. And, like, I have no desire to sit and reminisce about things that happened when I was 17 years old. So you move, you move apart, right? And that is okay. I think a lot of people feel like they must keep hold of relationships that they have had at any point in their life, especially if they were very meaningful at that individual point in time. Jonathan does not like ruminating on things. He doesn't mind <laughs> What's telling ruminating like, mean in case we like to ruminate. like to just keep thinking on something over and over and over again. He doesn't mind remembering like good memories, like some like a funny story or whatever, but he's not gonna sit there and like dredge up the past he doesn't like talking about past relationships he doesn't you know it's just him it's like it's over you move on and it's not even because he has any bad feelings about it it's just like it almost becomes irrelevant to him so it's it's uh it's and i'm i'm the opposite i'll like dissect and think through and bring up stories about you know junior high crush i had and and john just doesn't think that same way yeah, I, I'm, I think I've always been pretty good at not falling into sunk cost fallacy because I realize all you can do is make the best decision you can at this point in time 
and move forward. I think that's right? also why his timing is always wrong. He'll say something happened. <laughs> he'll say something happened like two years ago and it happened 10 years ago or 10 years ago and it happened last month. You know, he's, and I think it's because he's just not sitting there cataloging his memories all the time. His, no. his, and it's so weird because with poker, obviously your timing has to be so precise, but in life, his timing is not, not very good. He's always on time for things, but his memory of time is not good. Correct. Based on the disc profile, let's see. I have disc profiles somewhere, if I can find it on my computer. Um, so... Tough spots, right? You'd remember every hand you played the day before, though. When it comes to poker, he has a very, very good memory. When it comes to remembering a friend we eat dinner with the night before, the name escapes him every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I... I'm always trying to look forward and move forward and progress. And I'm not oh, saying that you do anything. But then he remembered, we were watching, uh, I don't know if anyone else has watched Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. It's a really funny show. All of a sudden, we were like talking about something else. He goes, oh yeah, that's like Mimi Canassis. And I go, you remember the name of a random character on the show and you can't remember any of my friends? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I see Mimi Canassis every day on the show, right? <laughs> it was so funny. Oh my God, he surprises me. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, you have, you have to be able to move on from things that essentially don't matter anymore, right? And there are many things that people get emotionally attached to or emotionally attached with that results in them doing things that are maybe illogical. Magic the Gathering is a good example with me. I have a nice Magic the Gathering collection back here. I would be incredibly envious as a young boy. But is there any real purpose in that? John Jonathan claims it's going to pay for our kids' college one day. I sincerely it doubt it. Um, nostalgia is something a lot of people hold on to, perhaps like very subconsciously, right? Like uh, you had good times is what it amounts to. Same reason people hold on to friends, they hold on to relationships, they hold on to things. They had good times in the past, and they don't want to feel like they are losing those things. Um, I mean, when when people when relationships break up. It, there's a lot of sunk costs there, right? You got married, that, that cost money. Maybe you had kids. You maybe bought a house. There's a big pain when it comes to breaking up. But essentially what you say is, I would rather have a future without this person than stick around with a future with this person. And that's, that's a big, difficult decision. What? But even you, actually said before, we were talking about this. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but we oh were boy. talking about... You know, people getting divorced who have kids. And obviously, we can't understand what that decision must be like and how hard that must be. But Jonathan is convinced, right? Convinced that he, does, he can't see any scenario in which he would leave because we have the kids and he'd want us to stay together for the kids. Which is obviously a very valiant thought to have. But he also thinks that because we haven't run into such a substantial issue that his mind would change and he would think I have to get out of here. So even though John is saying to you right now that, oh, if something's not working, like leave, you know. It's easy to say, but it's not happening. Easy right? to say, but it's hard to do. And even in a hypothetical world, Jonathan has admitted to me that he doesn't think he would be able to do it. Um, well, so, I mean, we, we, we had the example I, of what if you're out cheating on me? Would I be okay with that in exchange for... I just basically just make you into a roommate, right? Yeah, we, John's like, that's fine. We can just be roommates and take care of the kids. Yeah, I don't want to leave the kids. And I don't envision that. I don't envision John ever being okay with that actually happening. So, I, you know, I think it's. It would be annoying. It's it, not it, optimal. <laughs> so anyway, it's it's one of those things. It's easy to say. It's very hard to do. Which is why poker is hard. Yeah. <laughs> which is why any any situation where you feel sticky. Is hard. Andrew says, what? <laughs> I'm pot committed to marriage. I think I'm, I'm pot committed to my kids, right? I'm not going to leave my kids. Well, but you don't and have to leave your kids, but you don't have to live with them. All right, let's move on to a different one, because then we're just going to go down like a very dark road with this. Uh, well, our time's most up anyway. Oh, Perfect okay. time to end. Perfect time to end. I wrote, I wrote down here, it's an important thing. All you can do is make the best decision you have with the information with the, in, the, in the current environment and the situation you're in and then move forward. 
Wikipedia had a good example. Um, I'll reference Wikipedia again. It said, imagine you're building a power plant. You spend $2 million, or $10 million, $2 million, you're building this power plant. And to finish it, it'll cost another $10 million, okay? But then some new technology comes out that makes an equally good power plant for $5 million. We've got to build a power plant. What do we do? Well, the answer is you take that $2 million power plant you started building so far and you muck it. Maybe you can resell it or something, but you why muck did, it. Why did you choose a power plant as your example? Because that's the one Wikipedia used. It's a good example. Um, and new technology is coming out. Not because your wife happens to work in energy? Let me, let me tell you, though, there's no sunk cost there. If you abandon the uh, plant oh. you started building, you get a deductible loss, likely, on your return. So, <laughs> so there is so no you sunk make cost. It, you make it up, you get, like, you know, so you're going to get 21% of your benefit back, based, you know, based on your tax rate, but whatever. Well, 21% back is not a ton. It's still something. So you get whatever it is, 400K? You get $400,000 back. So you lose $1.6 million, right? But it's the right play. If a, you can just build a, a new one using the new technology for $5 million, as opposed to spending an, an extra 10 or 8 or even 6 on the old technology, assuming the new technology is correct. Are there ever spots where the new technology is skeptical? Where well, yeah, like, there's I mean, some gamble in it? New technology is new technology, right? So, you know, some, some people stick... You know, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there is some... I mean, I don't know because I'm not an engineer. There you go. That's the right answer to a lot of things. I don't know. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a blank, right? So that's all I have today. All you can do is make the best decisions you can in your current situation and do not hold on to the past, I guess is what that amounts to. Is that, I mean, I don't know. Is hold on to the past the right thing to say? Well, I think, I think the real issue and part of what you were reading off of that Wikipedia page is that a lot of events are independent events. And a lot of people forget that. And so they feel like they have to make decisions. They're forced into decisions based on prior actions. And they're not. They're independent. So if something doesn't seem like the right thing going forward, you leave it and you, you, know, you start again. Right. So in, in our case with the, the place we rented, I paid a bunch of money for this place. I wanted this place to be good. I go to this place. Some things are okay. But the place is unlivable. Right. And I that, must make so a decision that money, to is, that money is gone now no matter what. So you either so that action is gone. What you decide going forward is independent. So do you want to leave and try to salvage your happiness, or stay and and you know potentially not be happy? Right. But and some then, people will think that well, I already paid the money. I should make the best of it. I have to stay. I have to stay. I have to make the best of it. I came all the way here. Or if you're in Las Vegas and you decide to go to the buffet and you pay fifty dollars <laughs> for a nice buffet, but you I get have there to eat everything. and the food's actually not all that great. So you have a little bit enough to fill you, but you're not that, going to go off and eat all that, of it. Yeah, and we've had that discussion at buffets, actually, because sometimes <laughs> you go to, I've gone to the buffet and I'm just actually not that hungry. So I get some fruit, I get some, I don't know, whatever, and I sit down, I'm like, I could have paid 15 bucks for this instead of 40 for the buffet. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, but at least you have the option and, you know, you don't have to feel like you have to fill your plate just because you're there. So. But even if you planned to fill, fill your plate... You went to that buffet fully planning to eat a load of food, but you get there and it's just all bad. Then don't eat it. Then don't eat it. You don't have to eat all the food. It's okay. You can move forward. That's all we had to talk about today. It seems like some of you are subscribing on Twitch. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you enjoy this, thank well, you. go to pokercoaching.com. I'm giving away a bunch of free money right now. Or as Thomas says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> he says, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we're giving away 2500 bucks this month. I think we already gave away... 750 of it or something like that. Go to pokercoaching.com slash free cash to get in that. I sink a bunch of money into <laughs> giving away money to you all every single month. We're giving away some more. Check it out, pokercoaching.com slash free cash. You're going to have to answer a poker question correctly to get bonus entries. If you get it wrong, well, try again next time. We'll have another one coming up soon. Anything else you want to talk about? Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here today. I always like it when Amy's on. Amy always says... um, should I come on the show today? If you all don't like Amy, send me an email and tell me why. And if I get more than 25 emails, we will not have her on anymore. But if I get fewer than 25 emails, then she's just going to come on whenever she feels like it. Today was actually supposed to be an off day for us, so um, that's why Amy's here. We were going to spend the day upstate with the children. We were going to take them to a swimming hole today. Yep. But we're not doing that. So. But we're not doing that. All right. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. We will be back bright and early Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time for more little coffee. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, click like, click subscribe. If you like this, tell the algorithm. Where do you point? Click um, like, click subscribe. I think it's below. 
Click like, click subscribe down there. <laughs> Where would it be? Is it on this side or that side? That side? I don't know. This side? Have a great day.